Good evening, y'all. Thank you all for the opportunity to do this. Um, and thank you, Pastor Sam, for taking time away from your naps to come and <laughs> uh, teach us on Tuesdays and, and do Preaching Lab and, and open this time up for us. I'm very grateful. We're going to be reading from James chapter 1 tonight. Um, real quick, I'm Joel Kukis, by the way. Uh, <laughs> my wife is Shelby Kukis over here. We have four sons, uh, an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and two one-year-olds. Um, we have a really loud house, but we have a lot of fun. Uh, we've been coming to this church for 10 years or so, <laughs> um, and y'all have raised us up, and we're so thankful for it. Uh, the love of this church has changed our life completely. Let's open up to James chapter 1, 21 through 25. <clears throat> I'm going to start in uh, verse 19, actually, just to get the context around it and go through 27. But the focus of the message will be 21 through 25. All right. Y'all there? <laughs> it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Lord Jesus, thank you for your scripture. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who just captures us when we read your word, Lord, and presses it into our hearts. God, thank you for this opportunity to share your word with my church. And God, I pray that um, I handle your word well. I pray that you open our hearts to hear from you tonight. I love you, Lord Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right. My takeaway truth from this section of scripture is hear God's word and do God's will. It's hear God's word and do God's will. I have three points that I took away from James 1, 21 through 25. And the first one is from verse 21. Receive the word. Point number one is receive the word. James 1, 21 says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The first chapter of James teaches us a lot <clears throat> about wisdom. We need to receive the word in order to receive wisdom. And when we reject the word, we're rejecting wisdom. The word of God says that wisdom starts with fear of the Lord. Um, Kevin Van Hooser, a professor at a Bible college, said, pride does not listen, it knows. We need to keep that in mind when we read the word. We need to rid ourselves of pride so that we can hear from the word. We hear, you know, there's, there's a lot of voices in this day and age. It's hard not to hear things. I mean, like I said, I got four kids. There's, that's a lot of voices. Um, but we hear voices all the time. We've got unsolicited advice on social media, godless guidance on the gram. We have falsities on Facebook. We got terrible talk on TikTok and sinful, snatter, uh, sinful chatter on Snapchat. Um, you know, but who are we listening to, church? Are we listening to the world? 
Are we listening to the lies of the devil and following the father of lies? Or are we listening to Jesus, the father of light, our father in heaven? James tells us, get back to the word. Receive the word. Listen to your Savior, Jesus. And he was pointing his people back to the word 2,000 years ago. And today, he's still pointing us back to the word. Now I have a question. Why is it so difficult for us to open the Bible? James says, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. You know, the word of God is like a mirror. And sometimes it's an ugly mirror. Uh, Mirrors, they're not fair to everybody. Uh, Some people can look in the mirror and they see a pretty nice reflection. But when I look into the mirror, it's it's not so pretty. Uh, You know, the word of God is a mirror. (laughs) The word of God is a mirror like that. Um, When we read it, it reads us. It's a hard mirror to look into. It shows us our filthiness and it shows us our rampant wickedness. But that's a good thing. You know, how would we know what to change? How would we know what honors God if he, if he didn't give us his book and show us? When James says put away in that verse, he's referring to taking off. And the words that he uses are, are to paint a picture of taking off a, a garment of clothing, like a dirty, filthy garment of clothing. And he says receive, that word receive is in the same manner, paints a picture of taking a new garment of clothing and putting that on. You see, Shelby and I have a farm, a small farm, and some days I'll go out and I'll work on that farm, and I really enjoy doing that, but I usually get filthy. My boots are filthy, my pants are filthy, I'm sweaty, and when I come into the house, I take my boots off and leave them in front of the door, and I take my clothes off and I throw them on the floor, because that's where she asked me to put them. Um... (laughs) I do all that before I change into clean clothes. You have to take off your dirty clothes before you change into your clean clothes. And you know, my house is like, it's, it's kind of like magic. Um, my dirty clothes go on the floor and then they come back out of the closet clean. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> it, uh, you know, but praise God in the same way, we just, have to, we just have to take off our filthy clothes and he gives us the clothing of righteousness to put on. And the word teaches us how to do that. Now let's look back for a second at verse 19. It says this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So James is equating slow to speak and slow to anger with filthiness and rampant wickedness. You know, why why is he doing that? He answers his own question later on in verse, I mean, in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, when James tells us that the tongue is a small member, <clears throat> yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. James is using strong imagery. Our tongue is untamed. It's creating and spreading hellfire. So we have to be slow to speak. If we're going to receive the word and walk the path following Christ, we have to be slow to speak. You know, the simple action of choosing to be slow to speak leaves a lot of filthy and wicked things unsaid. And and he also tells us to be slow to anger. And anger does not produce the righteousness of God. We know that from the word of God. Anger stirs up strife. James, when he said this, he was quoting Proverbs 14.29 and pointing his people back to Proverbs 14.29, which says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. But he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Isn't that the truth? You know, when, when, when tempers are high, we easily lose the ability to reason and understand. We lose control of ourselves. And when we approach the Word of God to read it, when we, we, when we approach the Word of God to hear what God has to say to us, we have to take off that anger, and we have to be slow to speak. We have to take off of our own opinions of what we think the Word should say to us, 
and we should receive what the word is truly telling us. When James says, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, remember put away in this verse is, is meaning literally to take off like a piece of clothing. He is saying to come with clarity of mind, ready to receive what the word of God is teaching. Paul put it this way in Colossians 3, 5 through 10. <clears throat> he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, our Lord Jesus. We put off the old self in order to open up the word of God and hear and be transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit and by the work of God's holy word. And in this, we're remade into the image of Christ. This is a warning that if you come to Scripture with filth and wickedness in your mind, if you come to the Word of God with anger about what it has to say, you are already twisting the Word into your own words. Your own wisdom of this world and your own ideas are influencing what you're going to take away from the Word of God. Um, I'm in seminary now, and that's called eisegesis. You know, <laughs> exegesis is, is reading the Word and, and taking away what it is truly meaning. Just learned that this year. Aren't you guys proud? Uh, and re remember, it's, it's hard to, to learn when you already know something. You know, pride does not listen. It knows. So we have to put that away and pick up the word of God. Instead, James pushes us to come and hear the word of God with meekness. He says, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Meekness is humility. It is the humble heart that comes not to fight against God, but to listen. It's the humble heart that listens to God with self-control, seeking something new, something fresh from the living word to take away so that, so that you can grow as you follow Jesus Christ. You know, couldn't we use more humility as a nation and as a church and as individuals in this nation? Gosh, we could use humility so take off your dirty garment of sin and come to the word humbly ready to be renewed by the holy spirit when we come empty of our own garbage we can be filled with god's goodness when we come free of worldly wisdom we can surrender to the implanted word the word of god is alive and the word is ready to revive as we hear the word, the Spirit stores it up inside us. The word does not only save us eternally, it, it saves us daily from our own flesh and our own sinful nature as we walk the path that Jesus has for us. As, as, as we come to the word with an open mind, unencumbered by our preconceptions, and we hear it and we treasure it up in our spirit, James says, receive with meekness the implanted word, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So what are we receiving? We're receiving the implanted word. Implanted means something deeply rooted and firmly founded. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. I cannot think of something more implanted, more deeply rooted than creator God himself, the Alpha and Omega, the eternal God, who created creation with just this spoken word um, in, the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the implanted word. The word, th this living word is able to save our souls from eternity in hell. We're born heading to hell. We're born separated from God because of our sin. But God gave us a way out. The implanted word, the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave us a way out of hell and he gave us a way into heaven. 
We start our eternal relationship with God our Father the moment we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. And then he starts working in our hearts. And, and you know, if, if you hear him knocking, then, then turn to him and accept Jesus. Let him rescue you. And I want to tell you, at the end of this service, I'm going to ask that anyone who isn't saved would, would come forward and accept Christ. You know, I, I sat in Sunday night services, and I went to Wednesday night services, and I wasn't saved, so I know that somebody out here isn't saved. And the Lord Jesus is calling you and has been calling you. You can be in church and not be saved. But don't just come to church tonight. Come to Jesus tonight. As followers of Christ, when we come to the Word, it continues to save us. It delivers us from temptation. It saves us from ourselves. The Word of God brings us closer to God. It's a lamp to our feet and it's a light to our path. The Bible is the, the, the best disciple maker. It's important for each of us to have a mentor, but it's more important for each of us to be reading the Scripture and being filled with the Word of God. Sanctification is the process of being made holy. It shares the same root, at, root word as saint, which is sanctus, and that literally means holy. And what does holy mean? Holy means set apart, to stand out, to be changed from old to new. Um, as Christians, we should be set apart from the world. We should be kind of weird. There's a, lot of <laughs> there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. And, and if we obey it, we'd be set apart from the, word, the world. So let God make us holy. Let sanctification take place in your life by reading the word and receiving it. God wants us to be holy, and he uses his holy Bible to do it. So let the word of God continue to make you holy. And, you know, we, we need to be so full of the word of God that it's overflowing within us, that it's oozing out of us into everything we do. And, and everywhere we touch, we leave Bible fingerprints behind. You know, we're all full of something. Um, some people are full of politics. Some people are full of sports. Some people are full of education. Some people are just full of themselves. But, you know, <laughs> whatever you take in is what you're going to spew out. Which brings us to our second point we see in this passage, which is replicate the word. James 1, 22 through 24 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forget what he was forgets what he was like. We need to replicate the word. We need to replicate the word, not complicate the word. Jesus is recorded saying, follow me 21 times in the four Gospels. John 12, 26 is an example. Jesus says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. James is pushing us to pay attention to the do's of the Bible. Remember, James tells us that faith without works is dead. He is telling us to do the work that God has clearly laid out in Scripture. It's not complicated, but it's not easy. When I thought through what a Christian is to do day in and day out, the word that, kept, that, that just kept coming to my mind was per, uh, persevere. In order to do the do's of the Bible, a Christian needs perseverance. When you are not being a doer of, a wor of the word, but a hearer only, you are deceiving yourself, which is literally to mislead yourself. To do what the word has for you is to follow Jesus. To disobey the word is to follow yourself. It's to mislead yourself. Hearing the word and not doing it is communicating to God that You've opened up his word, and you've heard it, but your ideas are better. You've heard his word, you've heard his thoughts and his desires, but your desires are more important than following his desires. If we hear the word and, and we do not apply it to our own walk of life and let it change us, then we are deceiving ourselves. 
We're deceiving ourselves into thinking we have true religion because we have studied Scripture in and out. In verse 23, when James says, look intently, it means like truly study closely. In David Platt's commentary, he said it's like a child crouched down studying a bug intently with a a magnifying glass and, and, and just checking every little piece of it out. And, you know, I was thinking, if that was one of my kids, they'd probably pick that bug up and eat it. <laughs> but probably, that's probably true. Um, you know, and maybe David Platt's kids are smarter than mine. But James tells us in verse 27 of, of chapter 1, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the word, the world. He doesn't say that true religion is to study the Bible and walk away and never apply it. James doesn't separate faith in God and the application of the word of God. They're two in one. Remember, it's simple, it's not easy. The expectation that James has is that we hear the word and apply the teachings of the word. It can't be one or the other. You know, if, if you buy some furniture off the internet and it comes in a box with all 5,000 pieces. You need the instructions to put it together. But reading the instructions and not putting it together is not going to help you. But trying to put it together without the instructions isn't going to work out either. So what we need to do, church, is we need to get into the Word and find out what God would have us to do. Opening the Word is absolutely necessary to being obedient to God. And now after we have heard from the word, we have to replicate that word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. We hear the word of God, we accept it as truth, we hide it in our hearts, and then we do as it says. Doer literally means obeyer. So be an obeyer of the word. Verses 23 and 24 say, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. This man who looks into the mirror and goes away and forgets what he was like is a man who does not persevere. He looked at the word, he heard the word, but he did not truly hear it. After hearing the word, he went away and chose not to do it because doing what the Bible asks us to do is difficult. He saw what he could be if he chose to be transformed by Christ, but then he went away and he forgot who he is in Christ. Let's not be like that man. Let's remember who we are in Christ. Jesus has a way of getting into us and changing us if we let him. That sanctification, the transformation towards holiness that we talked about earlier, This comes from Christ alone. In sin, we don't change, but in the word, we can't help but change if we truly listen and our hearts are truly open. And and if we want our families to change, we have to be obeyers of the word. And you know, when the individual is biblically illiterate, then our families are biblically illiterate. And when our families are biblically illiterate, our churches are biblically illiterate. And when the church is biblically illiterate, that city is biblically illiterate. And when that city is biblically illiterate, that state is biblically illiterate. And when that state is biblically illiterate, our whole nation is biblically illiterate. So if we look around at our nation, if we watch the news and say, what is going on? How can this be? It should disgust us as Christians to see what's happening in this nation. But if if you're looking at that, the only solution is to open the word and hear from the word and start changing your own life start replicating Jesus in your own life and and learning that way you'll you'll take that and it'll overflow and you can teach your children you can teach your church and then that's how we'll see change if you want to see our nation turn back to God you need to turn back to God and you need to submit yourself to the word of God we need to replicate the word we need to live out the word And that's every last part of the word, not just the parts we love, but the parts that are difficult for us to hear. When we live out the word, 
we'll run into barriers. We'll run into opposition. We'll run into spiritual warfare. We'll run into exhaustion. But our call is to persevere. Are we to continue in a course of... Um, we are to continue in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty. That's the definition of, of persevere, is to continue in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The prescription to persevere has side effects, and the side effects may include blessing and the crown of life. Perseverance, it has other side effects. It encourages those around you to persevere themselves. When you see someone faithfully following Jesus Christ, you are encouraged to do the same thing. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 4, says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, our encouragement, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance, perseverance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured, persevered the cross, despising the shame. And he is seated, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured, who persevered from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Jesus persevered even to the cross because he believed that the difficulty he was facing, even the difficulty of the cross, was insignificant compared to the reward to come. That should be our attitude also. We should persevere through all of life's trials as Christians because we know it's worth it. We know that God will be glorified. We know that there will be blessings in it. We need to persevere. And we need perseverance in all things. We need to continue to hear the word of God and apply it everywhere he commands us to. As individual Christians, we need to persevere. We each have a ministry that God has called us to. We need to be obeyers and choose to obey Jesus in doing that ministry. And once we're in that ministry, we have to persevere because it's not easy, but it's essential. Every individual makes up the body of the church. Each ministry we have is our place where we participate in the body of the church. When one member falls out, that burden is placed upon another member. When one member suffers, we all suffer. And burnout is becoming more and more common. And one of the reasons that is, is, is people are not persevering in their ministry because they're not looking to Jesus, so they quit. They don't believe in the promise, so they quit. And then the next person is even more overloaded, so they quit. And on and on, like dominoes, people get burnt out and they fall down because one person didn't, couldn't persevere. So as Christians... We need to persevere in our ministries. And we need to persevere in sharing the gospel with others. To me, this, this takes endurance for me. I, I don't like rejection. And you know, when, the, when, the, when you share the gospel and it's rejected or brushed off, it can become heartbreaking. Um, but Jesus tells us not to give up. Keep on praying for that person and keep sharing the gospel regardless. And as families, we need to persevere. Husbands and wives need to persevere. Followers of Christ, the church needs to divorce, divorce. Because divorce is destroying our families. Husbands and wives need to persevere through the problems because there is a reward. God promises that. You know, uh, Vadi Bakum, he, he's a preacher. I was listening to him and he said that um, he tells his wife two things. He wishes they got married younger. And if she ever leaves him, he's going with her. And I said, that's good. Shelby, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. That's a good place to be. And you know, when, when husbands and wives persevere through their problems and choose to honor God and each other by staying married, that marriage becomes a threat to the devil. 
Satan is threatened by families who persevere. <clears throat> because when a husband and wife persevere, their children will be better off. Their churches will be better off. They'll encourage other families to persevere and other marriages to continue on. And Satan knows that, that if he can defeat marriage, he can drag people down. But if, if followers of Christ persevere, they'll lift each other up. And another, another thing, going back to the illustration of taking my clothes off after coming in from the farm, if I trumps through my house with, with muddy boots on, I'm going to get mud and other stuff from the farm all over the house. It's, it's going to fall, and I've probably done that before, maybe. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and that's the same way with our sin. If we don't, as a family, if we're not taking our sin off, if we're not repenting, that sin isn't only affecting us. It's affecting our whole household. We need to repent of our sins. And we need to persevere in our marriages. In churches, we, we need to persevere as church also. We live in an anti-Christian culture. The church is going to continue to fall under more and more pressure to backpedal on our convictions, on biblical mandates. But <clears throat> if we cave to that pressure... They're only going to ask for more. And then we're just going to continue stepping further and further and further and further away from the word of God because we failed to persevere in one place. So the church can't jeopardize the word of God because of the whims and the whining of man. No matter the consequences, God calls his church to be steadfast and unmovable and firmly founded on his scripture. The church needs to stand firm and persevere. James was writing this book to Jews at the time. And some of these Jewish people, they were considering um, giving up their faith in Christ to, because of the, the persecution they were facing. They were considering giving up their faith in Christ and turning back to their Jewish religion so that they, they, they would not have to go through the difficulty and the persecution that they were facing at the time. So James is encouraging them to persevere through that. Following Christ is worth it. And that's what the church needs today. It's the same today. We need to persevere and follow Christ because it's worth it. Jesus persevered. Replicate Jesus and replicate the word. <clears throat> Living out the word takes energy. Perseverance takes energy and our energy runs out. Doing and doing and doing can get exhausting, especially when the work is never done. You know, it's like laundry and dishes. As soon as you get through it, it's just starting over again. So our, our work in Christ is similar to that. We're called to love and to forgive and to be generous and to be selfless and to be kind and to faithfully fulfill our ministries. You know, that work, it never stops. We never get to clock out from that work. So how do we continue doing day after day? Let's take a look at our third point from verse 25, which is remain in the word. James 1.25 says, <clears throat> But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We have a solid rock that we get to stand on. We have an unchanging Savior that we can remain in. Remain in the Word. We remain and we abide and we persevere and we do it all because it glorifies God. We are blessed when we glorify God. Look at this. Look at how these verses start and finish. We start with filthiness and rampant wickedness in, in verse 21. And then at the end of verse 25, we end with blessing. And there's a path there that we get to walk down. And it goes like this. We are wicked and stained by our filthy sin. Then we look into the word. We cast off that wickedness. We take it off. And we exchange it for Christ's righteousness. And next we begin changing into Christ's likeness. We study the word and we store it in our hearts. Then we obey the word. Jesus strengthens us in our obedience. And then at the end of the path, we find blessing from God. 
when we see God at the end of the path, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. But praise God, he doesn't leave us alone to fight our way through. He says, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, what is the perfect law? Is it the Torah? Is it, is it the law of Moses? But it's not so much a what as much as it's a who. The perfect law is the fully accomplished law. It's the finished law. It's the fulfilled law. And who fulfilled the law? Jesus Christ, our Savior, fulfilled the law. And what is the law of liberty? Isn't that law and liberty kind of an oxymoron? Is it laws or is it freedom? Is it, is it freedom or is it laws? I don't know. What, what it's telling us here is it's freedom from slavery. It's the law of liberty. It's freedom from slavery. We're born slaves to sin. John 8.34, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I said to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We're born slaves to sin, but Jesus Christ frees us from that slavery and we get to become his servants, we get to become his friends, and we get to become children of God. And James says, persevere. So after we submit to Jesus, he tells us to persevere. That is to be faithful to him day in and day out. That is to choose him over every idol that comes our way. That is to not get choked out by the weeds. It's not getting choked out by the worries of the world. But it's to continue steadfast. We are to abide in him. Remain in Jesus Christ. When we face the trials and the temptations and exhaustion and frustration, and when we just want to give up, God tells us to persevere. I mean, that's a lot of pressure if you're on your own. That's a lot of pressure, and that's why you don't do it on your own. And praise God, we're not on our own. James doesn't end there. He doesn't put a period under, uh, you know, beside persevere and say, good luck, everybody. No, there, there's more. So let's read it one more time in its entirety. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Remember, a doer was an obeyer. Doing, in verse 25, is obeying. And it's, it's obeying what? It's obeying the word of God that he has heard. So to be blessed is to receive divine favor. And when we put it all together, James is telling us, when we choose to follow Christ and be obedient in his word, he will be with you. He'll be beside you. And he will be blessing you along the way in your obedience to him and to his word. So <clears throat> we can praise God Almighty for the cross. We can lay all our burdens down at the foot of the cross because we have Jesus our Savior, who didn't stay on the cross. He didn't stay in the grave. He rose again. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, <clears throat> For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus walked through every trial and every temptation, and Jesus persevered. So because of his perseverance, because of his strength, we can draw near to him for his mercy and his help when we are in need. Jesus will carry our burdens for us if we let him. Jesus will bless us as we walk in obedience to him. He'll strengthen us, and he'll give us the ability to persevere. And he has grace for the times when we slip up. Praise God for his grace. So that's why we remain in the word, because it's where we find strength to replicate the word. Follower of Jesus, what we need to do, we need to repent daily. We need to read scripture daily. So, so that's lay aside the dirty garments, receive the word, repent daily, read scripture daily, lay our burdens down at Jesus' feet, and live out a God-honoring life. And do it through the help of the Holy Spirit. Don't do it alone. Don't try to do it on your own strength. You won't be able to. But Jesus has come for us so that we can persevere. Receive the word, replicate the word, and remain in the word. If you have never received Christ, please come forward.
Put your faith in Jesus. There's nothing like it. He'll change your life. You'll be able to soak in his love. You won't be able to go back after you receive Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for this message that you've given us tonight. Lord Jesus, thank you for your holy scripture that we get to have. God, you didn't leave us here stranded, but you came back. You came back to save us from our death. God, you're so good. Thank you for your grace, and thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to share your scripture with these people. God, may your name be honored and glorified in all of our worship. In your holy name we pray. Amen.